This lecture will cover the arthropods, also known as ectoparasites. I'm Dr. Paul Pottinger. A very quick tour of the arthropods. I want you to understand how to identify these little creepy crawly creatures and be able to tell the difference between an arthropod assault and the pathogens that they transmit. You should also be able to associate these vectors with the common pathogens uh, that they transmit. So here we are in the tree of life. These are the arthropods. They're also called ectoparasites. Unlike the endoparasites, the ectoparasites, uh, they live on your surface. Sometimes they can just get into your skin, but basically they are professional blood suckers and skin eaters. And there are many of them. They all share the characteristic that they have an exoskeleton and articulated legs. They look like, well, they look like bugs, for lack of a better scientific term. There are many species, but only a handful that are potentially harmful to humans. We only have time to talk about a few of the major groups. First of all, how do they make you sick? One of two ways. Number one, you can have an allergic response to the parasite antigens when you're becoming infested with them. So one classic example is their saliva. The saliva of a creature, when it's sucking your blood, will get into the subcutaneous tissue. The saliva is showed to the dendritic cells that are doing immune surveillance just inside the skin, and they will recruit an inflammatory response that leads to what we've all seen an itchy bug bite, red raised itchy papules at the site of the bite. And this happens with mosquitoes, fleas, ticks, mites, flies, bed bugs, lice, you name it. Here's one example. This is Pulex irritans, the human flea. The patient on the right has been bitten time and time again by fleas. They've just been hopping around having a feast on him. If you zoom in, you can see that these are papules. You can feel them with your fingers. They are raised, they're incredibly itchy, and they're in a linear pattern. That's sort of breakfast, lunch, and dinner. When you see that linear pattern of bites, even if you don't see the uh, pathogen itself, in this case the flea, which has hopped away a long time ago, you know that your patient's been bitten. Uh, that's for saliva. Sometimes it's just the bug itself. So this is a germ called Sarcoptes scabii. What scabies does is it burrows into the skin, very classically into that web space between the fingers, and it just sort of munches on your skin and poops and lays eggs. And when it does that, those antigens and the feces uh, and the eggs that it lays in your skin are obviously very irritating as well. In some cases, it's just an itchy rash. In other cases, when the immune suppression is severe, such as a patient with advanced HIV, you can have terrible disseminated cases of scabies. For historical reasons, it's called Norwegian scabies, which is a terrible term. You don't get it in Norway, and it's not a different species, but you'll see that term used in the medical literature. Now, that's the allergic response, but the other reason that these things can get you sick is because they can serve as vectors for infections. And so many of the other classes that you'll learn about of germs in this course, bacteria, viruses, other parasites, they can be spread to humans through the bite of these arthropods. When that happens, the arthropod is called a biologic vector. So some of the main classes, ticks. You know them, you love them. They have eight legs, and they will feed either on humans or animals. Actually, they really prefer animals. They're professional um, hangers out on grass, and they will grab on with their legs to passing by warm-blooded mammals like deer or mice, etc. And when humans go into those parts of the wilderness, we can become, in effect, accidentally bitten by these ticks. Uh, there's two different groups. There's the hard ticks. You see on the bottom left, Ixodes scapularis. That's the tick that spreads Lyme disease. And then there's Onothodorus ticks, uh, which are a part of that soft tick family. They look a little bit different, and the bottom line is that uh, either one of them can serve as vectors of infections. They will take several blood meals during their lives. Remember, they have ectoskeletons, so they have to grow and then molt that skeleton. And every time they do that, they go through a new phase. With a hard tick like Ixodes, they start as a larva, then a nymph then become an adult. And each time they make that transition, they need to have blood in their belly to nourish that change. Why are they a problem? Because they can spread infection. And although Lyme disease is the most celebrated tick-borne infection in the USA, there are others, including other Borrelial species, Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, and other Rickettsiae, Ehrlichia, Anaplasma, and Babesia. You will learn about these uh, germs elsewhere in this course. Number two, lice. Now, they have Six legs, and unlike the ticks, which like to be in the wilderness, lice like human beings. That's their job. There's several different subcategories. The first is Pediculus capitus. That's the head louse. We've all dealt with this in our own personal lives, our kids, or when we were young children. And it loves to go to the head of your hair. And children, no matter how cute they are when they get their heads together, 
these creatures can crawl from one head to the next. There's another subspecies called Pediculus humanus, that's the human body louse. It looks basically the same, but it's not adapted for the head. It's adapted for your body, and it likes to live in the seams of clothing. When you put clothing on, it'll come out uh, from those seams in the clothing and, and bite you right on your body. So that's a huge problem for patients who are living in austere settings, such as in refugee camps. Once these lice get into clothing, especially clothing items that get shared person to person, people can become infested. That's a big deal because the head louse does not spread infection, but the body louse does. And the most classic is epidemic typhus, which is an infection, basically an influenza-like illness caused by a germ called Rickettsia prowzekii. They can also spread trench fever, Bartonella quintana, and louse-borne relapsing fever caused by a bacteria, Borrelia recurrentis, all spread by the body louse, not the head louse. And finally, there's the pubic crab louse. Well, this is it. It kind of does look like a crab, doesn't it? It's got a smaller body and these big hook-like claws, well adapted for the human pubic hair or for the uh, eyebrow. If eyebrow hair comes into contact with pubic hair, it can spread that way as well. If you see one of these from the itchy groin of one of your patients, you can tell them you know what it is, you can fix it, and yes, they have a sexually transmitted disease. Now, next come the mites. These are truly tiny no germs. They have eight legs, and they're almost barely visible if you look carefully. They're pretty much microscopic germs. We've talked about scabies as one of those germs. Scabies, not a known vector of human infection in terms of other germs, but there are other species that are mites that have adapted well for other creatures like mice or birds, and if they get into human beings, they can accidentally spread infections to us. The most classic are rickettsial pox, uh, which is caused by rickettsia acari, and scrub typhus, caused by orientia sutsugamusha. You'll learn about these elsewhere in the course. Then there's fleas. These are six-legged creatures, and they are epic jumpers. Uh, they can jump thousands of times their actual body size. The main ones we see are human fleas, pulex, but also rat fleas, Xenopsila, cat fleas, and dog fleas, tenocephalides, and the deal with these guys is that they are usually not vectors of infection, but in particular, Xenopsila, uh, and in some cases, tenocephalides, can spread infections. Yeah, Xenopsila, the rat flea, that's what spreads bubonic plague, uh, and what has caused so much trouble in uh, historical Europe. But tularemia, caused by Francisella tularensis, or murine endemic typhus caused by rickettsia typhi, these can be spread by the bites of fleas. And lastly, there's the mosquitoes. Well, we've all had mosquito bites. They have six legs, and if you look carefully, you'll see that there are three subcategories. The first is Culex, the common brown mosquito. These can spread infection. In the tropics, that's filariasis. Here in the United States, that's that main vector of West Nile infection. Next, Aedes, Aedes aegypti, Aedes albopictus. These are the vectors of yellow fever, dengue fever, and chikungunya, viral pathogens. And finally, there's Anopheles, right? So this is the vector of malaria. You can see in this case, Anopheles is a little bit different, isn't it? It does not have that humped back. It's more like a straight line as it takes its blood meal and potentially spreads malaria to this patient. How do you diagnose patients with these infestations? Well, sometimes you'll be lucky and see the bug. So this is a picture on the left of my arm after I went hiking uh, in Westchester County, and a couple of days later I realized there was a nymph that had been feeding on my blood. Uh, so you see that, there's your problem. Uh, uh, that's the diagnosis. In the case of Norwegian scabies or other scabies, gently scrape the skin to see if you can find on a microscope the eggs or the adults themselves. If you see that, you've made your diagnosis there too. Sometimes you won't see the bugs, but you'll just see the eggs they left behind. This is a knit, which is uh, the egg capsule that a head louse has laid on somebody's hair. At the top image, you can see there's still a larva inside, and the bottom image, sorry, it's already hatched and made its way back out uh, to feed on your scalp oil and blood. Uh, sometimes you won't see either the eggs or the adults. You just see that bite pattern. If you're astute and you recognize a linear bite pattern, you can say, the bug is gone, but I know you've been bitten before. And then finally, sometimes you won't see any skin findings, you just make a diagnosis of a clinical illness, for example, epidemic typhus. If you see epidemic typhus, then you know that these patients have clothing and belongings that are infested with lice. We have to uh, decontaminate them. How do we treat these patients? Well, if the bugs are gone, we give them symptomatic therapy. That's anti-inflammatories, antihistamines. If they're scratching themselves into a skin infection, we will treat that. 
Number two, we want to make sure that they have or have not acquired a vector-borne infection. Uh, in this particular case, if you see bites and you know your patients are living in uh, a refugee camp, you need to worry about the possibility of epidemic typhus. And of course, helping people reduce the risk of delousing that population. And then finally, what if your patient is still infested? So number one, remove the tick. In this case, we'll use tweezers very carefully to the head and not the body. Gentle inline traction, which pulls out uh, the head of that uh, tick so that it can gradually, over a period of a few uh, seconds, release its jaws and uh, get the whole head out intact. And number two, if it's not a tick, but if it's lice or ticks, uh, excuse me, if it's lice or mites, we might have to go after them with a topical or even systemic treatment. There's a whole family of these preparations, some of which are over-the-counter, some of which have to be prescribed by you as a medical doctor. They all go after these creatures. They are of varying efficacy. Some are more toxic than others. You will, in time, become familiar with the agents that are best for you particular infections. And finally, sometimes we have to augment what we do topically with an oral agent such as oral ivermectin, the same drug we've given for other parasitic infections like strongyloides. And then when we're done with that, yep, treat them symptomatically for their itchy, itchy skin. So the key concepts for the arthropods are that they are tiny animals with exoskeletons. They happen everywhere on planet Earth. Many of them like people, anthropophilic, but some of them are adapted better for other mammals. The infestation can cause an allergic dermatitis, but they may also be vectors of infections. Uh, we'll make a diagnosis either by recognizing the bite, looking at the burrow pattern, looking for the adults or eggs in the skin or the hair, or sometimes just knowing that the infection you have diagnosed must have come from one of these biting arthropods. What do we do? If you see one of them, remove it. Uh, you can smother them with the poisons that I've showed you, or you can poison them at the source in their food, that's your bloodstream, by giving oral ivermectin. Prevention is all about improving sanitation and getting people better housing and clothing. Thank you for your attention.